Hey, what's up, everybody? Derek Acosta here back once again on microphone to come to you with an all new podcast. I know it's been a while since you've seen me on camera. So today I figured I'd give you a little bit of an update about what I've been working on for the past, gosh, I don't know, seven, eight, nine months. I'm going to be interviewing a special guest today, a friend of mine. His name is Brian Patrick Butler. He's a filmmaker from here in San Diego who actually gave me my first feature film role two years ago in 2021. I was in a movie with uh, that Brian wrote and starred in called Hemet or The Landlady Don't Drink Tea. That movie is currently doing a film festival run where it is getting some great reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. I'm going to talk to Brian about his movies. That movie, his first movie, Friend of the World, which also has a 90 on Rotten Tomatoes. And we're going to talk about his latest movie called A Corpse in Kensington, which I'm happy to say I've just been cast in as the lead in this feature film. I'm really excited to talk about it. The film also features a famous actor you may have heard of, Michael Madsen. We're going to get into all that and a little more. And I'm going to tell you some personal stories, some funny stories about what I've been doing for the past eight months. It's going to be a wild ride. So thanks for joining us today. Let's get into it. What's up, everybody? Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's your favorite boy, Derek Acosta, here with a special edition podcast, giving you a little update. And with me, my guest today, uh, filmmaker and actor, Brian Butler. How's it going? Hello, hello, hello. Good to be here. Thanks for having me, Derek. Uh, yeah, happy to have you here. You're here today because I want to talk about some of the uh, film projects that I've been working on in the past. And you're a big part of that because we've been working together on some capacity. For a couple um, years now, yeah. yeah, you're a local filmmaker, and I've been trying to get in more into acting too. Um, been doing some short films. Uh, you're you're an actor, right? You're you're a film director, but you started as an actor, correct? Yeah, yeah. I was like nine, and I set up the tripod and made like a Frankenstein movie and you made action figures. You made a Frankenstein movie when you were nine years old. Yeah, man. I was Doctor Frankenstein. I was the Hunchback, and I was the monster. And I put like uh, Sharpie uh, stitches on my face, and I got my friend to play a character, and I got his go to his house, and his sisters would be in the movie. And yeah, um, that's cool. You know, when I was making movies, uh, I don't know if I started at nine years old. How'd you, did your dad have a camera or something? Your parents or something like that? They did, yes. Okay. It was uh, just a camera for, uh, you know, life events. And uh, my brother, my big brother Dan, he'd do stop motion Jurassic Park stuff with our toys. And I thought that was so cool. And he'd, he'd, I had like Toy Story action figures. He would make movies with those. And maybe one time he had me be like Andy or something. I, I don't know. But that got me kind of into it. And then uh, I kind of just hijacked mom and dad's camera and started making my own stuff. And okay. And yeah. then um, for me, I got into plays with this local theater company, CYT Christian Youth Theater. Were you ever involved with them? I auditioned. It oh, was not good. <laughs> it was not good. Dude, the auditioning for CYT as a child is like fucking nerve wracking. Yeah. And like, I only wanted to know? do it because my best friend was doing it. Um, you know how it is when you're eight. Yeah. You're like, eh, my friend's doing it. I want to do it too. And exactly. I was just happy like we got to hang out. So it could be something you hate. And you still enjoy yeah. doing it with them, but yeah. So, um, but recently I, I was in this, uh, I was in this short film. Um, it was in LA, I'm in San Diego and they put me up for the night in a hotel room. I think it's a funny story. Just that like, I think this is like, uh, the, I, I think, okay. So let me just say. At first, I was like, hey, no problem with this hotel. But like slowly as I was in there, I started noticing little things that were like little red flags to me. Like the furniture had like graffiti carved into it and stuff, you know, like you would see like people would tag in school. Mickey was here. Yeah. stuff. Yeah. But I couldn't read it because it was all like the graffiti font. Yeah, yeah. And I pick up the remote to turn on the TV and the back of the remote is like. Uh, the battery cover is missing and it has like packaging tape on the oh. remote 
and the packaging tape looks like it's stained with like uh, it looks like coffee stains or something like some sort wow. of brown liquid. So they took the time to fix it. They just didn't do what they should have done. Yeah, which is replace the back of the remote. Ex- on and it, Amazon, and, and, and it's a little know. greasy too. And I'm like, oh. this is a little dirty, you know. And uh, and I'm noticing that like the pillow has like a makeup stain on it, and like one long hair just like mm. embedded onto the pillow. And then I was like, all right, let me uh flip this pillow over and like the other pillow has another makeup stain on it. And I was like, okay, I'm looking at the bed. The bed has like some makeup stains on it. Someone was crying and they didn't take their makeup off before they went to bed. (laughs) Yeah. What 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 story took place here? Something. There was evidence of some sort of history in the room. You never want to go into a hotel room and be aware that the previous uh, inhabitants were there, right? Is there any blood? Or you, it may have been. Oh, yeah, you, don't, yeah. you don't fucking know. And I'm looking and there's like stains on the lampshade that also look like coffee. Where did those come from? How did I don't know. <laughs> and like, you know, everything is fucking stained and like... Uh, I go to use the bathroom and, and it's really small and cramped and I like open up the window. There's like no screen on the window. It's just like literally I'm like looking out onto the street and I'm like, this hotel's a little dirty, you know? I don't, yeah. I don't know if I want to get in the sheets here. So I walk to like a local supermarket like Ralph's and uh, you know, Ralph's or Vaughn's, you know, these supermarkets in Southern California. I don't know if you know this. They sell pillows and blankets Hmm, never noticed. Yeah, you probably never noticed no. because they're really shitty, low quality, seasonal. Like it's like in their Easter section, or their at this time it was like Valentine's Day, so it was like a Valentine's Day plushy uh, pillow and like a Valentine's Day heart covered, like really ratty ten dollar blanket. Paper. Yeah, like oh, the the yeah. kind of like a kid would like my blinky like drag around with them. I got some of those, like twenty bucks worth of that. I took it back to the hotel room and I just laid that on top and I. And I like slept in my clothes on top of that. And uh, but at the end of the day, and I'll have to put up a picture of this. I was like Googling, like, what is this hotel? And I think this is the same hotel <laughs> that they filmed the Chop Suey music video okay. for System of a Down. OK, I was going to say that sounds like amazing art direction for a movie. Yeah, but because real. the Google review said, like, this is the hotel where they filmed Chop Suey. And then I was like furiously Googling that all night. And that's the one good thing about it. And I, I'll try to put some pictures up in this podcast because it, it looks totally remodeled. But uh, I was texting uh, my wife about it. And I was like, I think they filmed Chop Suey here. And she's like, yeah, I think the windows look the same. Everything else looks different. But the wind and I like did a side by side comparison on my phone. And I was like, no, the architecture looks totally oh, different. Okay, okay, okay. But the layout of the windows. So I'll put that on screen now. And you be the judge. Does this look like is this the Chop Suey Hotel? Um, Blast the song. Yeah, so yeah, that song's been pretty much stuck in my head ever since. <laughs> uh, I had a terrible hotel experience real quick on a movie. He's, someone we know, love him, but it was a bad hotel. Very thin walls. I'm really worried about memorizing my lines. I'm up all night till three in the morning, and the people in the next room are just having sex Yeah. for like an hour. And Mrs. Doubtfire played, and I could hear every line of dialogue <laughs> from Mrs. Doubtfire from beginning to end. Um so that was an experience. Pl- yeah. Mrs. Doubtfire was in their room? In their room. Oh, okay. I could hear every word through the wall. That's how paper oh, through the wall. Oh, shit. I heard every thrust. I heard everything that happened. Every yeah. squelch. You're like, do, 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 do. Yes. you're missing Mrs. Doubtfire. And I think they were involved in the movie, too, but that's all. The next day on set, I just got vibes that maybe some people were, you know. Really? Had a lot of chemistry? And, and it felt like they were trying to drop hints. You know, messy, yeah. messy hair. Did anyone hear anything weird last night? Literally, and I was. Just Who like, else watched Mrs. Doubtfire last yeah, night? I heard Anybody? It was on. Yeah, I know. Remember they that didn't. scene where she covers her face in pie? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, it's funny because I looked up this. Uh, so I've looked up System of Down talking about where they filmed that music video. I'm like, yeah, when we were kids, we always walked past this hotel that was clearly just used for hookers and drug addicts and we just wanted to find the shittiest hotel we could to film our music video boy did they yeah so i was like oh i'm a little part of uh music video history here um but yeah i was was your mrs doubtfire hotel was that uh what city was that in it was um the desert by salton sea okay salton sea yeah were you uh um, really out in the middle of nowhere was that a movie you were directing or just acting in? Just acting in. Oh, okay. The movie didn't end up happening. 99% of movies don't happen. 
But this one went really far. We got all the way onto set, and a number of things happened that sort of undid the movie. Like really? Twine. Have you, know. you what? Could you go into what happened? Uh, I I wasn't involved in the production of it. I've oh. heard like stories and stuff, but I it was just um, just it, it it's usually money. It's usually things that happen where uh, some emergency happens or or uh, last minute change, and the money just gets bottomed out in the whole movie. Um, so you just had a movie that you acted in and wrote, mm -hmm. and that I was in. You're in it. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about that. He stole the show from me, man. I don't right think so. Right in the middle. I don't think I don't, I I don't want to overhype it, but if you ever see the movie, you'll uh, really enjoy his part. The movie um, is called, it has a long title. It's called yes. Hemet or The Landlady Don't Drink Tea. Yes. Now the podcast is over. We spent the whole podcast saying the title. It's like Spaceballs, the ship going for like 10 minutes. Well, it's like Dr. Strangelove. Yeah, exactly. Or how I, yeah. or the part of the title that I don't remember after Doctor or Strange. Or Salo, Salo, or the 120 Days of Sodom. Oh, okay. Yeah. Is that more of the inspiration for Hemet? I'd say, yeah, probably directly. It's like Salo is like I don't know if you ever seen mm. Salo. No. I don't recommend anybody watches Salo, but it's it's visually disgusting, and Hemet is like audibly disgusting. Salo pushes you, uh, what you can watch. Hemet kind of pushes you in terms of like what you can hear. Your screenplay, uh, it, it screened at the Oceanside Film Festival here in Southern California. It got nominated for Best Screenplay. I think people liked the dialogue that you wrote. A lot of bad words. A lot of um, what was the line? Your character, you play an old landlady. Um, you're in full makeup, so you're playing an old old woman who has a really foul mouth. What it's yeah. like my four favorite drinks, I think, is a line in the Drink movie. Four things, blood, cum, coke, and rum. And I've already had three of those today. Yeah, I think that's like the standout. You should put that like on the poster or okay. something. It's a standout, maybe maybe okay. not on the poster. Depends on the distributor if they're cool with come. That's gonna be like I'll be back. You know, yeah. that's one of those lines that just resonates with people. It's a mouthful. That should have been the title. Hemet or I drink. Or I drink cum, four things. Coke and rum. Yeah, yeah. You could call the movie I drink four things. Um, how's the movie doing? Like now that it's done, you're taking around film festivals. How's like that all uh, working? Uh, it's it feels like. With every movie I've made, there's it, it kind of does better and worse than I thought it would be doing. Uh, in terms of the reviews and the reception it's had, is people really seem to get it. That's yeah. the best feeling ever is, is these Rotten Tomatoes critics saying, he did this, 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 and this, and, and this happens in the script, and this actor does this, and, there's, and they totally get completely what we were going for. Uh, that's the best <clears> feeling <throat> ever. There are a lot of festivals saying, yeah... We don't, we, we kind of felt uncomfortable with the language or whatever. And even some festivals that we got into were like, we felt uncomfortable with the language, but we were like, you know, fuck it, let's do it. And I was like, <laughs> that's where I want to be. This movie um, made us cool. Yeah. So it's controversial in that regard. You're really getting um, people who are like uncomfortable with the language? That yeah. seems so bizarre to me, like an independent film festival. Ah, like, I know. It's a the PC uh, sort of thing where it's just like, uh, there's too many buzzwords in it i guess and i, I watched the it. movie yeah am i crazy it didn't to me it didn't seem that controversial am really? i, am okay. I crazy like, now that's almost sad to hear i i liked the idea of it being controversial but uh no to me it that's just another it's just another monday morning to, to me kind of um I guess so. Like I've I've written stuff for Mega sixty four. I've written a lot of skits. I've written long form stuff for Mega sixty four, and I've toyed around with screenplays, uh, which I have not yet produced. So you're ahead of the game than I am in that aspect. But whenever I write stuff, it's fucked up. You know, <laughs> like the dialogue. Like nobody holds back. Like people say, maybe it's because. I'm in the realm of the internet where you can pretty much get away with saying whatever you want. Is that why those scripts haven't been produced yet? There's they're that they're that vulgar. I don't I'm, even, I'm interested. I, I, I don't I'll oh, show yeah. I'll sh we could talk about it later okay. after camera. I have oh, a couple yeah. that I'll show you. But uh No, no, they haven't been produced yet because uh it's just something that is on the uh there's a laundry list of things we're working on and that's kind of at the bottom of the laundry okay. list but but they're they're personal projects that I'll get to after the comic book is done. You know, I'll work on a movie or something. But um getting back to the vulgarity, yeah. um yeah, maybe it's because I'm on the internet where people could say whatever they want and can pretty much be as heinous as they want. 
I thought that the movie kind of towed the line. It's it's kind of like it's a comedy. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not yeah. like a even if it was a drama, I feel like I don't know. It's just I feel like I've seen worse movies, honestly. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And there was like a I don't know. I, I wanted it to be as gross as possible. And it wasn't even like uh that wasn't the mission statement of the movie. Let's make the grossest thing ever. It was a, a movie made in anger about not to get too political, but it it is uh it that was the inception of the movie was a political situation that I was angry about and personal situations with actual landlords I've I uh, lived, you know, in the same apartment as. And the idea of these just these bullies uh, you know, running the country or or running uh, my apartment complex and and just that frustration and uh, the audacity of of this kind of hostile takeover of this person where you're just like, how did you get to be in this position? And um, just wanting to capture that in a character. Yeah. And so that's where the vulgarity comes from. But there was this kind of like, I wanted it to be good too. You know, you know what's funny too is maybe I'm just fucking thick headed. The movie didn't strike me as political either. Really? Okay. It's like uh, under the surface. It's a landlady, but yeah, she's. I mean, I get it. And maybe it's because where I'm from, born and raised, like that is the characters in that movie reminded me of people that I just knew growing up. People who uh, are gun toting, red blooded Americans who are like, you'll take this gun from my cold, dead hands. Like San Diego. Yeah. Mm -hmm. San Diego, if people don't know, is not like it's it's weirdly conservative. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's there's hippies and new age uh, beach bums. uh, But there's also like a huge military presence here because of the the. Base. Marine base. Yeah. yeah. And I just feel like it all kind of mixes together and meets somewhere in the middle. Mm-hmm. Or maybe it's just like a place where people of all different kind of uh, everywhere on the spectrum come melting and mingle, pot. mingle together. Yeah. A little bit of a melting pot. You also get people from Mexico coming up who have a whole different kind of view of the political landscape where um, it's kind of like a skewed. It doesn't really fall on like the liberal conservative spectrum. It's kind mm-hmm. of like a third aspect of it. Yeah. California too. Blue state, but just a lot of, a lot of conservative yeah. Answer, yeah. That's the state of Ronald Reagan. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it reminded me of like people in my family, people I knew growing up. The movie didn't have like a political story to it. So yeah, I think it's kind of buried in allegory just under the, under the genre stuff. Cause it was like, yeah, it was like, I want this to have a, a structure and a backbone that is inspired by this political situation but it wasn't like a direct allegory like Animal Farm where it's like every single thing these animals do is what happened in yeah. the Soviet Union. It was just more of an allegory of this character who is, yeah. So in that movie, you play, um, can we talk about the movie a little yeah. bit? I don't know how much we could spoil on camera yeah. here or whatever. Yeah. You, you play spoil your stuff, of course. Uh, I, won't, I won't spoil too much of my stuff. But <laughs> you play a landlady named Liz who's like, what, in her 50s, 60s? Yeah, probably. Uh, 70s. 70s, yeah. 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 You're Pretty in old. full, full, like, makeup. You look like a golden girl, <laughs> basically. <laughs> yeah, 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 totally. Um, yeah, very cliche uh, landlady archetype. And Liz owns an apartment complex, a small one, maybe like eight, eight apartments. Mm-hmm. I thought it was really well filmed i know you filmed it at a house in a couple locations but it, mm-hmm. it kind of like read on camera like a legit like apartment complex oh, kind of in the yeah. middle of nowhere i was surprised yeah, yeah. they, they kind of look like that and i, I kind of googled some Hemet apartment complexes what they look like we filmed it at my dad's house which is a one story and our director tony almost did the uh, vfx and he added a second, a second story, story which to I, match his interior which had stairs inside i didn't even notice like it looked really good um, and Liz kind of runs the uh, apartment complex with like an iron fist, you mm-hmm. could say. It's like kind it's, of a butthead. It's yeah. her way or the highway. Yeah, yeah. Um, and she just, uh, yeah, from the first scene is like, uh, there. I if there's one thing I could add to the movie, it would be like the first time you see her, she just like chugs a whole Red Bull because like she's in her 70s, but she's got all this energy and strength and she talks really fast and yeah. she's very much a character, uh, very idiosyncratic and, and almost doesn't belong in this universe. Um, but yeah, and then she's just completely contemptible in every way. There's like, um, almost like a zombie element to the, to the movie as well. A little subplot. Yeah. But it's people who are, um, is it, is it a, they're doing drugs. Bath salts. They're doing bath salts. Bath salts make you eat people. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 
So, I mean, it's not an overt, like, horror movie plot, but there is, like, uh, kind of this background chorus of zombie-like characters that surround the complex. Right. Um, but I guess really what the movie is about is Liz has problems with her tenants, mm -hmm. and uh, without going into too much, the movie starts resulting in uh, murders and crime, cons in conspiracy to commit crimes... Yeah. Against some of these tenants. Yeah. There's a, it becomes like a war and a battle of uh, wits kind of. And that's kind of where the, where the political influence was, is this horrible person takes over and all these people who think that they're good guys and self-righteous become so obsessed with this person that they become hateful and they go crazy and stuff too. And, and that's kind of <coughs> where the movie becomes a uh, evil character. People have to react to the evil character and they, kind of turn evil they in, lose in, themselves in, a little bit in trying to take them down yeah and okay. then there's zombies is kind of this like backstory that uh, uh, that's another thing festivals were disappointed some were saying we wanted more zombies and it's like well, it's not about the zombies it's about the people the zombies uh are kind of in the background but they um the idea of the zombies and what makes the zombies comes into play at near the end of the movie so it all just kind of tie together at the okay end, the different genres i watched it with my wife and she uh, said it was a feminist movie have you heard that? Not wrong in saying that. Yeah. Yeah. She says that the main character is a real powerful uh, female. Badass. Who, yeah. Who kind of like doesn't take shit and is put through a lot of shit, but fights back against all of it. Dragged through the mud, even though the other is a, the worst woman ever played by a man. And uh, <laughs> but it, it's a feminist movie. Totally. Yeah. And it wasn't even like we're going to make a feminist movie, but it was just like, that's the character. And uh, just all kind of worked out that badass. way. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was smart. Uh, you got a lot of some of the you know, San Diego doesn't have a whole giant community of famous actors in it. But you kind of got some of the bigger actors locally. You got me. You got the main guy. <laughs> Lucked out. No, but you got a uh, like uh, Eric MacArthur, Randy. Yeah. Uh, I always Amy Lechois, Nick Young, some people from LA, Pierce Wallace is amazing. Yeah, people who were like doing TV shows. Um, Randy was in a David Fincher movie, I yeah, think. Mank. Or Mank. Yeah, Mank. Yeah, he had some lines with Gary Oldman in that movie. Uh, his last name is Davidson. Davison. Davison. Yeah, I always add another D to it. He's great. We used to do like Dinner Detective together. Hell yeah. Hell um, yeah. I don't think either of us are doing Dinner Detective anymore. Another thing you did that I auditioned for and didn't get in. You're lucky, Dinner Detective. <laughs> I was jealous. There's was, so much talent. Was there. not all it's cracked up to be. Can yeah. I just say, Dinner Detective, I thought you would be putting on a play while people are eating dinner, but what it ended up being was you're there pretending to be a normal person eating dinner. Oh, one of the plants. Yeah, yeah, yeah most yeah. of the cast, if you're not an actual detective, most of the people are just plants, and so you end up, it's really nerve-wracking because people are like, so why did you come to Dinner Detective tonight? And you're like, um, well, I'm actually uh, a journalist because that's your role. And you're like, really? What newspaper do you write for? And you're just like lying to people all night. You're not performing a role. You're just like lying to yeah, people. Yeah. And it's it's extremely stressful. And you're like, are they going to catch me? Are they gonna, you know? Yeah. And uh, I think I lied too well because nobody ever suspected me of being like a plant. And then I was like, well, maybe I should make them suspect me a little bit. It gets like super psychological. <laughs> so like when you're like a serial killer and you're, you like want to get caught. Kind of, like, I want them to know how smart I am. How a I little <laughs> bit. Like you want to let them, you know, I think I maybe ruined the fun of it for some of the people because I was too like undercover. <laughs> They're like, you were a plant. I thought he was a journalist. <laughs> I, I believed him when he, he had said such it. a good story and all these details, you know, and at the end of the day, some people like after dinner, just feel like, well, you lied to me. Like, I don't even know who you are. But like, ah, oh, I guess I, <laughs> I'm sorry. So you feel like you betrayed these people. Yes. So hurt and yeah. And so it was very like stressful. And I was like, I don't know if I could be this character and You're like, I'm sorry guys. I'm just that good. Yeah. Eventually yeah. though, I did like work through and got promoted up to the rank of detective. And then that was fun because oh, yeah. people know you're a part of the show and you're fucking with them and you're making them laugh and play that into it. And presentational once you work your way to the top it gets fun but those those other roles are extremely hard to do um in in your movie Hemet, i play a police officer um i can't i don't want to say too much yeah and i won't go into it but um it was yeah. it was fun to do we shot the movie in 2021 i only have a couple of scenes in the movie and i actually it had been so long i forgot 
what my scenes were. <laughs> so when I watched it at the film festival, I was like, hey, that was pretty good. Like, And I think we filmed your stuff at a different location too. It's like this, the actor you're interacting with is at a completely, he's 40 minutes away. Yeah. We filmed the exterior somewhere else and you're there to like feed him lines and you come out in the exterior. Then it was like a couple weeks later, we go to the actual location. So I'm sure your mind was just like, how's this going to, yeah, fit together and I'm having a conversation and I'm in I'm inside an apartment as a police officer and other characters outside the apartment. We're talking to each other, but the interior and exterior were two different sides of the city. Yeah, film bleak is apart. So at both times I was just like talking to basically nobody. And, and you're so you're watching the movie in the audience, kind of like for the seeing it for the first time. We did the reading and stuff, but you're really kind of seeing it pieced together yeah. the scene for the first time. Uh, but it was fun. It was a really, it was a really fun experience. That was actually the first, um, like feature length movie I'd been cast in outside of like my own stuff that I'd worked on. So I was happy to have the experience. And you freaking stole the show in your little scene with Randy and, uh, I love that you say that because I'm self-conscious and I'm like, eh, was that good? Like it doesn't fit. Like again, I, everybody else there was like so good and professional and I'm like, I'm a little like goofy with my character, but it fit and it's and it's it's kind of how it how it works in the script too but uh i i show it to people privately that's the scene that gets the most laughs and we've had uh, two festival screenings now and i think the theater just explodes okay two parts yeah. a moment of levity um yeah. are people at home going to be able to watch this movie um anywhere yeah we're uh, seeking distribution right now we've sent it to a bunch of distributors uh, a few of them have asked for uh, streamers so uh, we'll see and if okay. uh, and if we don't end up getting a good deal with any distributors we're going to uh, self distribute on um you know a bunch of different platforms so it, it should be out in the next six months to a year okay yeah Yeah. pretty so stay tuned we'll give everybody an update out there you have another movie that you made that's currently available on like amazon prime and tubi plex tubi yeah a bunch of different platforms on imdb they have all the links um yeah it's got it's got good ratings on rotten tomato Mm -hmm. yeah do you know what the current rating is you look that up uh yeah we just had a gizmodo article from last year it just got approved for rotten tomato so now we have 21 uh, rotten tomatoes reviews uh, for a ninety percent fresh rating, so I think only two of the reviews were uh, rotten. Okay. And one of them was like this, like super uh, Christian uh, lady who just like completely bashed all over it and was like, "It would have been a better radio play, so that way we don't have to look at the screen." And I was like, "Wow, one of those." Okay, okay, but you know, it's good to have, you got to have one in there so it doesn't look uh, suspicious or anything. But uh, I was like, "Cool, we didn't." We got all these. We didn't have to pay for them or anything. People just liked it. You know, it's a uh, sounds like a very uh, Christian review. This yeah. shit sucked. Yeah. I, you yeah. couldn't pay me to watch this garbage. Oh yeah, totally. I was like, it's. I was like, why that? What? How did you end up with the screener anyway? Okay, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have sent it to. Well, a certified fresh ninety. Uh, that's pretty dang good. Yeah, and a eighty or a ninety-five for the audience, but that's only like I think like 50, 50 people rated it. Audience. That's still good. It's not like but 50 of your friends, though. No, no. All I right. Didn't, I didn't, I'm not sending it out to people having them do it. Well, then that's a random sampling. So, you know, we'll just take that at face value for what it is. The movie's yeah. called Friend of the World. Friend of the World. Um, so what's this movie about? People can watch this now if you want to look it up. Yeah. But, but what what's it about? It's a end of the world movie. Uh, it's kind of inspired by it's like a mix between like The Thing and, and Dr. Strangelove. And it's kind of like if there was a sequel to The Thing or if there was a sequel to Dr. Strangelove and those were just combined, what happens to these characters after the world uh, ends for them? And uh, it's this uh, young filmmaker and she's trapped in a bunker uh, after this catastrophic war is taking place. And this, the only other person uh, alive, presumably, is this general who takes her under his wing and escorts her through the bunker in this kind of like Dante's Inferno um, adventure where they see all these terrible things and there's this kind of like Hannibal Clarice dynamic between them of uh, mind games and despite their differences there is a connection and he's kind of challenging her along the way and there's a lot of body horror elements some cool practical effects in there so there's really cool visuals and then there's some cool thematic stuff going on as well it's kind of like a 50 minute Twilight Zone episode with insane effects and a little bit of uh, Liz's vulgarity in there. And um, yeah, it was kind of born from a feeling of isolation and 
maybe some paranoia back in uh, 2017 about like nuclear war and stuff. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 So when did you make this? This was uh, shot in 2017 and then edited in post-production for a couple of years. Fit the whole isolation thing, but uh, didn't really get to screen on a big, in a big movie theater, which mm-hmm. was unfortunate. It was just a, so it's just a streaming service, darling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. It's two actors, right? Two actors, and there's a couple other creatures and characters they interact with, but it's kind of just like a, a a Beckett play with some uh, nasty dialogue and and very dark concepts. You were, yeah, we were talking earlier. You said you studied film and uh, theater at SDSU, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, and you graduated in 2014? 2014. Okay. And then you made this movie three years later after graduating? Yeah. Did, yeah. You, did you make uh, short films at SDSU? Um, no, I had a film when I was at SDSU that I was planning, and it was this adaptation of uh, the Herald. From Scary Stories 3, The Scarecrow. Oh, okay, yeah. Really creepy Scarecrow. Uh, Those books freaked me out as a kid, and they're still, I don't know of any other more terrifying images than the Did you see the movie? Yeah, yeah. I appreciated it. It wasn't wasn't terrible. Could have been better, but I was like, man, they really, that creepy lady with the eyes and the the It was like a pretty good horror movie for kids. Yeah, yeah. A new whole new genre. And they did the visuals pretty well. Yeah, I thought that was cool. Yeah. I'm like, make more, bring it on. But uh, I did it first I, back in uh, 2014. Credit where credit's due. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But our, mine was like a 15 minutes thing, and I was at SDSU, and I was probably really like aloof some days. You just walk around with this uh, box of note cards, just doing storyboards. Okay. Everyone else had friends. I'd go get get drunk and be an ass at the parties at night. But at school, I'd be this nerd, just like in the under the tree, scribbling my storyboards for my movie. You know? Nice. <laughs> but uh, a nerd uh, on yeah. the street. The freak in the freak in sheets. The, uh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Thought there'd uh, be a better rhyme there, but. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was uh, somehow got uh, my homework done, and uh, in spite of all the partying, and and uh, graduated, and right after graduation, uh, teamed up with some local filmmakers, and that was my first movie proper with the whole cast and crew. And um, it was kind of stressful. Are you talking about uh, Friend of the World? Oh, oh, hatred, hatred. Hatred. Right. Okay, that was the, the Herald-inspired uh, movie. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's that was uh, the first short proper that I did with a cast. That Are your shorts movie. available anywhere to yeah, watch? That one's on Amazon and uh, Prime and probably a couple other uh, places. They online. just type in your YouTube. name to yeah. find it. Yeah, yeah. Brian, Brian Patrick Bu- Butler. Brian Patrick Butler. Look it up. Hatred, 2015. Yeah. So how did Friend of the World come about? Uh, I visited my wife in Japan. She was in Japan for a few months, and I stayed with her for two months. And I came back, and I was really jet lagged. And I would sleep all day, and at night I would watch these old weird movies. And I was putting on, I didn't realize this until like years later, but I, I must have put on the, the Evangelion tape, the last episode. Uh, I know it's like the bane of most fans' existence, that episode, but I really liked it, and I really. Uh, at night, I was alone. I was. You're talking about the final episode, the, final, the bad, the one that on the on the uh, on the hate mail he did on the back of hate mail, the weird sketches and oh, stuff. Oh yeah, I like that episode. Yeah, I I would put it on like every night, and uh, I'm gonna say yeah. that, but I'm gonna I'm sorry, I'm gonna correct you because I know the people who are watching this, they're already typing up the comments as we speak. <laughs> that episode sucks. I think it's pronounced Evangelion. Evangelion. Sorry. Yeah, Hi. I just want to not to throw shit. I think it's rude to correct people, but I know if we don't address it on camera, I'm glad to know it's going to be an issue. Even g- 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 Gellion. Yeah, there you go. There you go. And I'm sorry. There, I said it. A friend of mine uh, said that he was going to kill himself if he heard one more person pronounce it Evangelion. So, so glad that I said um, it. But don't, please. Sorry. I hope Johnny's not watching this. It's been rectified. All right. Maybe well, just cut it out. Maybe just cut the whole. We're gonna leave it in. Bit. We're gonna we're gonna leave oh, it man. in. It's okay. You still watched it. You could. You, they never said it in the show. How of course, yeah. It's it's Japanese. Oh my God, All right. So I watched it a bunch of times, and I sat down to write the script. I didn't. I wasn't thinking about that show at all. But uh, way later on, I was like, especially when I watched it, I was like, oh man, you totally. It's totally based on it, it not not based on not, it, there's a bunch of references to other movies but the heart of it I think is very much in line with that. Okay. So um 
you like the thing, if you like Dr. Strangelove, you might like it. And um, hopefully you like those enough to where if you hate the last episode of uh, Evangelion or if you hate me for saying it with the ja sound, um, hopefully the thing in Dr. Strangelove will get you through the movie. Okay. I love the last episode of Evangelion. I think the first time I watched it, it confused me. Yeah. And I was like, what is going on? And I was just disappointed because so much of the show is... A lot of the show is confusing, but you feel like you're following along. You're like, I think I can figure this out. They're giving me just enough of a breadcrumb that it's going to it's gonna make sense if I stick with it. And then that last episode hits, and it's the most confusing. All the breadcrumbs have dried up. And it. I think that's why it angers people, because they're like, fuck you. I don't understand it. I yeah. wanted an explanation. But then it's one of those things where after ruminating on it and kind of like thinking about it, you get a different perspective. You start to understand what's going on emotionally. And it's it, for the character. It works. But just for me, I saw it as this is the creator of the show expressing something painful and complex and nuanced yeah. and doing it in a complex, nuanced way where the rest of the show is Chris Nolan confusing where you're trying to figure out the plot. Yeah. The last episode is like emotionally confusing, like an art film or something. Well, I think, too, oh, voice is cracking. I think I just hit puberty, you guys. <laughs> Um, we're going to spoil it here. The final episode, it kind of, we're going to spoil it. If you haven't seen it, skip, skip forward. It takes place like in the character's mind mm -hmm. almost. And there's a very like, there's a rational explanation as for why that's happened. I think like the third impact has already happened and, and mm -hmm. they're all a, a collective consciousness at mm -hmm. that point. But you don't, you don't know that when you're watching it, they just throw you in. So you're like, this is a, this is a dream sequence. Like mm -hmm. what, what is this shit? And then it just mm -hmm. ends and you're like. That's it, huh? It's okay. So so happy. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it becomes so uh, cheerful. I think I end sudden. up. It's like the Sopranos ending of anime. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which I also love the Sopranos ending. I thought it was great. What did you think? Not to go on too big of a of a uh, segue, but about the the movies remaking it and making it totally different at the end. <sighs> Well, this is very, very current events here. I know you guys just did a. I am in the minority in this building where I am not a fan of the remakes because the show is already so weird. It's been out for 20 years. I feel like I just figured out the first run mm -hmm. and how weird it was. And they're getting even weirder mm -hmm. uh, with this one. But also it's almost like it's reaching a point of trying to outdo what's come before to where I just mentally can't keep up. Have you watched the remakes yes. at all? Yes. You know, these, and I feel like the fourth movie was like, none of that's in the anime. I think. Right? It, yeah. The it's kind of ends up the third one. It's or? gone completely on a new tangent here. And it's like, I, 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 I remember watching it and I can't even tell you what I saw. They were like yeah. levitating ships and yeah. doing like angel cosmic, yeah. like God sigils with like, yeah. The fucking military or some shit. And I was just like, it's a lot. It's a lot. But in terms of the very, very end that I, I was fine with all, this is all cool. Yeah. And the very, very end, I was just like better than the original. Is this what the fans wanted? I don't know, but maybe uh, I don't even recall how it all may, ended. You may have to cut this whole thing out. We're going to leave it in. Okay. We're, just, we're doing the discussion <laughs> here. I'm a big fan of the original series. Yeah. Um, yeah. I like the ending. I like the, the end of Ava, which kind of gives you the, the real world explanation of what's happening during those current events, but the new yeah. movies. And I also think the new movies suffer from being released over the course of like 15 years. Very frustrating. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, every time you watch it, you kind of have to watch all of them again. So it's like, it's up. like a huge undertaking. Or watched your yeah. I'll watch it in five minutes and yeah, yeah, yeah. well, we got to do the rebuild in five minutes. Oh God. Okay. That's not going to happen. Okay. Really anyway, just got excited. That's not happening. You're really long five minutes. Um, but, so uh, yeah, that's, that was, the, that was kind of like looking back, I think an inspiration on friend of the world. And I think on the movie we're going to do, there might be, there's a little bit of that too, but not, not consciously, okay. but, but just in terms of the character, just the re retreating into the character's mind. So reminds me of a real world story that happened to me a few weeks ago, maybe like a couple of months ago, I got trapped in a bar. I got locked in a, in a bar. And the police had to come and, really? and let me out. I'd, I'd say, leave me in here. I'm not going anywhere. Uh, so is that a bad problem to have? I just, this is, is like, right? uh, so what I've been doing since I haven't been on the podcast is, uh, just socializing, going out with friends. A friend of mine 
started dating um, a guy who was a bartender. And he was like, come out to my bar one night. You know, I'll give you some discount drinks. Like, you know, there's pool, there's darts. We'll have fun. So we're like, all right, let's take it up. We'll go on an off night. This was the plan. That was our fatal mistake. Mistake number one. We went on a Monday night. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know this. Monday night is like the most fucked up night to go to a bar. Because only the real alcoholics. The people who really hate their jobs. Who only, have to, yeah. Dude, for real. Like, the really miserable. The, uh, the people who are in the deepest, most traumatic throes of alcoholism. Those are the people who are going out heavy drinking on a Monday night. You know, like people who need to get away from their problems. They're at the bar on a Monday night. Thursday, Friday, Saturday. That's just normal people kicking back for the weekend. Monday, that's fucking hell night. Savage. And he told me later, he's like, I'm glad you're here, but I got to warn you, like Monday nights, like <laughs> something always happens People on a die. Monday night. Yeah. And he wasn't joking. And so we were there, we were hanging out and uh, there was a guy with his dog in the bar. And when we came in, he was like dancing with this group of women. So we were like, this guy's fun. But then that group of women left and that guy was by himself. I thought he was with that group, but it turns out he was just there by himself oh. socializing with his uh -huh. dog. So then he came over to our group. And we were playing pool and he kind of like just introduced himself. He's like, Hey, what's going on? We're like, Hey, what's up? And he's like, puts a hand up like that. And we're like, okay. And come shake his hand. He like slaps it so hard, yanks it in. He's Ooh. like, my name's Jonathan. And we're like, okay, cool. Nice to meet you. And he goes around and he does the exact same thing to every person in our group. My name's Jonathan. The Trump for you. Pull him off. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he's like, Talking to the whole group. He's focusing a little bit more on the ladies, but whatever. We're friendly. I'm not trying to like start shit. I'm not saying like you can't talk to the women in our group, whatever. <laughs> and we're socializing. We're playing pool. And after a few minutes, he comes up and he's like, what's your name? And I'm like, my name's Derek. And he's like, my name's Jonathan. And I'm like, yeah, I know. You've said that several times. You just said that. Yeah. And so clearly he's drunk, like really drunk. To the point where he's not even remembering what he's saying to us. And he's just like lingering around the group. So one of the people in our group who's dating the bartender goes and she's like talking to him. And after a while, the bartender's like, hey, Jonathan, why don't you come uh, close out your tab? And that was Get the hell out of dude, here. It was fucking on from that point. Just like, why do I have to close out my tab? I don't know. It's just, uh, you know, it's didn't want to get into it. But he's like, why the what are you trying to do? Why the? And it started escalating to the point where he's like, why well, I have to fucking close out my tab? You trying to kick me out of here? He's like, I'm not ready to close out my tab. But the bartender's like, I'm telling you, you're cut off. Ooh, like, wow. I'm not going to serve you any more alcohol. I think you should leave. And the dude just refused to leave where it started getting really angry. And then some other guy came in who's a regular at the bar. This dude's like six foot five or some shit. And, uh, Jonathan's like going around the whole bar. Am I making you feel uncomfortable? Do you think I should leave? And people are like, if anyone says that, so yeah, like, yes. uh, no, I, I don't have a problem with you. You see, they don't have a problem. Bartender's like, they're saying that because you're intimidating them. He's like, I'm not intimidating anybody. And he goes up to this dude who's like six foot five. And he's like, do you think I should leave? And the dude doesn't move. <laughs> he just stands there staring at him. <laughs> and now things are getting like really fucking crazy. Um, Long story short, those guys go to have a little conversation out in front of in the front door of the bar and a fist fight breaks out between them. Those two guys, those two guys, the silent uh, watcher giant and Jonathan and Jonathan's really tall, too. No, oh, okay. he's like my height. He's, oh. he's a little bit taller than me. Um, wow. He's asking the six foot two guy if he's into. Yeah. Okay. And they get into a fight and they get into a fist fight and the fist fight breaks up. And the dude, Jonathan, now that he's been cut off from the bar, he's been asked to leave. He's gotten into a fist fight with a guy. He still refuses to leave the bar. And he's like, I'm not leaving. And he's like making everybody feel uncomfortable. So the bartender shuts the door on him and locks the door with all you guys, with inside. all of us okay. in there. And it's like, me, three of my friends, the, the tall dude, and like one other woman. And then we're just in there waiting for, and every once in a while, he's like banging on the door and they, they're like calling the police. Like, Hey, we have a, and the police are like, yeah, you got to take care of it yourself. Like, Whoa. like literally everybody in the bar has to call the police at some point. We're there for like an hour and a half 
and he's just out there, like just waiting for us. And the uh, police just don't care. They're just all right. Eventually, yeah. you know, when it's like closing time, essentially, the police do show up. This is like two in the morning. Um, and that's when we're like able to be like, they unlock the door. They finally let us out. And then I think the police were honestly just talking to him too. They weren't going to like arrest him, yeah, yeah, yeah. but they're just like they're getting his story because he's like, I want to press charges because that big guy punched me and the police are like, okay, all right, well, what really happened here? And Started so shit with them. Yeah. Right, they're just right, like yeah. interviewing him. Um, and so we just got like, kind of like got into our car and the police, they're like, why don't you uh, leave that way? So you don't have to drive past this Thank guy. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Damn. That's a, like a normal Monday in Ireland. I'm sure you got the Irish experience right there. Yeah. yeah. I've never had that experience. I don't know if I'll be going out on Monday nights, uh, ever again, but, uh, I yeah. almost want to just to like, see, wait, can you tell us what bar it was or, um, I won't like, say what bar okay. it is, but it's a bar in like a shopping center. It's not even in uh, like a like a, a touristy part of town. Yeah. You know, it's like next to like a dance studio and like a okay. tennis supply store or something. Okay. Like really like out of the that way. Makes a little bit of sense. Like okay. a locals bar. Okay, locals bar on Monday. You ever okay. had an experience like that? Um, maybe where I've been that. No, no, no. I'm just kidding. Where they had to lock you out and you uh, refused no, to leave. But I've I have gone to bars where maybe the person, one of the people I was with, got kicked out of the bar or wouldn't let us into the bar and uh, for, for drinking too much. And you know what? There was one time. I don't remember how. I maybe uh, last year. Sorry, I hate to say this, but yeah, there was <laughs> last year. They were like pointing at me. That guy's too drunk. And I really? Like, yeah, yeah. And they're like, get out of here. And uh, so, yeah, that's happened. That's I've been I, I didn't get in a fight with anybody. Yeah. But my thing is, I think I come off way more drunk than I am. I think I just I'll have like one beer and like my eyes just like shut and I'm just like trying to carry on a car and I'm like awake. Yeah. And I'm like, so, yeah, you know, whatever, blah, 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 Evangelion, blah, blah, blah. sleep talking. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, and people think I'm really drunk, you know, and uh, but so I just have a really big tell. I had a I had a friend who got kicked out of a bar because they thought he was sleeping in the bar, but he was just like, he oh, just I'm a sleeper too. I'll he, just fall asleep. He was just yeah, fucking yeah, yeah. really exhausted. We were like at convention all day. We went to the bar and he was just like this on the bar table, and they're like, "Your friend's asleep. He has to leave." And he's like, uh, "I'm not asleep. I'm not asleep." And they're like, "Nah, you're asleep. You got to go." And he's like, "God, damn better it. to be asleep than to be fighting with people." Yeah, I you agree. Know? You know, some people go this way, other people go that way. Yeah. Exactly. Um. All right. Well. Let's talk about your new movie because it's starring me. Our new movie. Yeah, yeah our new movie. You recently um, offered me a opportunity to audition to be in your uh, next movie. It's a feature film. Mm-hmm. I landed the part. So we're going to be making this together uh, in the next few months. Mm-hmm. I don't know mm-hmm. how much we can reveal about the movie. I know it's still, uh, you're, you're keeping it close to the vest a little bit. So little bit there's there's some info online there's uh we're having a kickstarter not a kickstarter we're having an indiegogo fundraiser uh about two weeks and we have an actor attached michael madsen we've recorded some stuff with him he so far he's got a voice role in the movie if we raise enough money we want to expand his role and have him in a scene and Are derek you, derek would be in the scene with him yeah we'll talk more about that yeah, yeah. If, in just if, a second if, yeah. uh can we say the name of the movie yeah, it's called The Corpse in Kensington. Okay. Could we say the genre of the movie? However many there are, yes. Horror, comedy. Just like your other movies, they kind of blend a lot of different genres. Yes. It's like, this is supposed to be scary, but I'm writing the dialogue, so there's all these horrible cuss words and, and uh, situations. And uh, yeah, it's kind, of a, it's kind of a romantic movie. Probably the most like romantic movie I've done. A romantic horror comedy. Yeah. And by horror is a psychological thriller. And uh, some slasher stuff in there, too. Yeah, kind of runs quite a gambit. And it kind of toes the line on the edge of uh, some paranormal elements as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. There's hints of paranormal elements, but I'll leave that to you guys to decide if uh, those are real or not. Oh, yeah, so that gets back into the psychological aspect of it. So your other movies, um, they're doing well in festivals. They're doing, um, they're getting great scores on Rotten Tomatoes. This is going to be your third uh, yeah, feature third that I directed. Yeah. Okay. Well, so Hemet, you wrote and starred in, and then you, uh, directed friend of the world. Do you, do you have another uh, feature film that we, there's one that we wrapped a few years ago, shot it on the iPhone 
And I think it's pretty cool. It's not for everybody, but it's very gritty. It's this gritty neo-noir called Fruitful Mold. And like, if I had to be super confident in pitching this, I'd say it's like, like one of the bloodiest uh, color noir movies and one of the grittiest uh, color n modern uh, you know, neo-noir movies. And uh, it's just, it's a lot of fun. And it's just this adventure of this uh, detective guy or this, this uh, guy who's kind of going crazy who thinks of himself as a detective trying to solve this situation. There's also an antagonistic landlord character. And he gets in these uh, situations and they all become these horrible, disgusting... It, it's kind of like a Pulp Fiction if, if William Burroughs wrote it. So just a okay. really disgusting version of of uh, Pulp Fiction, these three stories that all end up with these disgusting, horrible, violent outcomes, and they all kind of tie up into one big story. Nice. Um, and that one's just, there was no budget, and um, it, I think it's going to be really good. It's just, it'll come out when it comes out. Okay. Still working on it, yeah. So right now we're focusing on A Corpse in Kensington. What is, like, the elevator pitch for the movie? If you have, like, a two to five sentence way to sell this movie to... Uh, the people who are watching right now, how would you describe a corpse in Kensington? I know I don't want to give, we don't want to yeah, give away yeah. too much of the story. So I'm going to leave this up to you. Cause like, I, I've read yeah. the script. So I'm like, oh, I don't want to say too much, but like plot wise, like a log line, kind of what's it about and stuff like that. Yeah. Just the hook, the pitch, you know, how I think people connect to it is there's this character, your character, the central character, a, a wistful loner who is kind of having a crisis. He returns to his hometown for kind of a getaway and he reconnects with his high school crush. Okay. The love of his life. Kind of his crush since he was a kid, actually. And uh, he stays with her for a few days. And she still lives with her boyfriend. And they're antagonizing each other. And this kind of love triangle forms. Underneath all that, there's this subplot about this killer. And their old classmates start disappearing. And so this romantic love triangle, dark comedy, crosses paths with this psychological thriller slasher movie okay cool yeah that's that's basically it what what i found was interesting from the comedy side is i have come back to this takes place in san diego mm -hmm. i've been living in los angeles i'm reconnecting with some old friends this crush who i've been obsessed with my whole life and they become for whatever reason uh it's explained in the plot but they think i'm currently homeless mm -hmm. like i've fallen on hard times yes and so they offer me uh an opportunity to sleep on their couch mm -hmm. and because i'm basically in love with this girl you're like okay i'll go with this i yeah, maintain yeah. the charade of like yeah i'm homeless and so even though i'm not i'm trying to uh maintain that lie and so some people know that I'm full of shit and other people are completely in the dark as to my real situation. Yeah. And so I thought that was a really interesting way to portray this kind of like comedy love triangle. And that's really what my character is focused on is like navigating this love triangle to get what I want. Yeah. And at the same time in the background, yeah, there's a serial killer operating in San Diego who seems to be moving closer and closer to this circle of friends that I am navigating through. And suspicions arise as to which one of you might be involved with this killer or might be behind the killings in some way. This paranoia, paranoia starts to rise. Yeah. And since my character is like clearly lying about something and hiding some things, like it starts to suspect numero uno, you know? Yeah. I have to like do this balancing act of like, well, if I come forward, I'm going to lose everything. But yes. if I, you know, if I don't figure out a way to, to, you know, if I don't do something, people are just going to think I'm fucking serial killer. It's a like fortuitous turn of events for you. This, this moment to finally have this one last chance with like the love of your life. Yeah. While all this other terror is happening in the background. I'm really excited uh, to yeah, film yeah. it. Uh, we're going to be shooting it starting, um, I think next month, right? At the earliest. Yeah. Okay. We might, it may be as early as next month, but over the summer, yeah. We're going to be shooting it over the summer. Now, you just mentioned a, mi a second ago, and I'm sure this is going to get a lot of people's attention out there, Michael Madsen has a role in the film. Mm -hmm. Michael Madsen from Reservoir Dogs. Hateful Eight. Hateful Eight. Free Willy. Donnie Brasco. Um, yeah. He's in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and uh, Sin City. You're talking yeah. about Frank Miller, you know? About it.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's excited about it, and uh, he's literally down to do more. If we can raise the funds, he'd be down to be in the movie. Right now, it's his, his voice, and it's a good voice part. He has a good part in the movie as is. But if we can get more money, if we can fund enough to get him on set, he'll have an even better part, and he'll have scenes in the movie, and I think his arc will be even better. I think the movie will be even better. So, uh, yeah, yeah, you mentioned, and we'll throw a link down below. If anybody out there is interested in checking this out, we'll put a link to the Indiegogo below. The movie is happening. Michael Madsen has already um, recorded his parts. He's wrapped on the movie. He, can I say his character? Yeah. Okay, he plays my father which uh, we're going to have to figure out what the relationship is there. I'm wondering what the mother looks like in this movie. There's a, like a line or something. We throw in a line. but uh, yeah. we'll, <laughs> we'll write it out. Uh, yeah. But Michael Madsen is in the movie. Uh, you've recorded his parts, but he has expressed to you he wants to be in the movie even more. Mm -hmm. And since we're going to be um, recording the bulk of the film in the next coming months, one of the goals of the Indiegogo is to raise the funds to um, cover the cost of Michael Madsen performing in the movie, mm -hmm. which I think would be great for greedy personal reasons, <laughs> because I want to have one on one FaceTime with the man on camera. Mr. Cool. Yeah. Mr. Black. Yeah. And blonde. blonde. Oh, that's right. He plays blonde. Mr. Blonde. Mr. Blonde. It's been a while since I've watched Reservoir Dogs. He feels like Mr. Black, though. He's the coolest one. He was always my favorite. Is Mr. Black guy. Harvey Keitel? I don't even know which one. I don't even know if they're it's blonde, pink, orange. I remember, uh, I think it's the guy who's doing the whole operation. He's yeah, like, fuck yeah. you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm Mr. Black. Mr. Black. Yeah. Yo, uh, Mr. Pink. Yeah, we're going to have yeah. some. Uh, currently, we have some scenes where we interact with each other, but I don't think we're, we have actual like screen time together as it is right now. But I hope that uh, with the support of people out there who find the Indiegogo, and if they find that this is interesting to them and, and uh, they want to be a part of it, that they could help bring, you know, arguably the two uh, greatest actors of our day together. Derek Acosta and Michael Madsen. Thank you. You took the words right out of my mouth. Yeah, yeah I'm super excited. This is going to be... So I already said, you, you kind of cast me, and outside of Mega 64, is like the first feature film I've done with people... Uh, you know, filmmakers here in San Diego outside of like my own core group, uh, had that small role as the police officer in Hemet. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to dive in to this, uh, lead character here. It's going to be a new side of Derek. You've never seen before. It's going to be, drama. uh, it's going to be a dramatic, it's going to be a dramatic film. There's going to be some comedy elements to there's, it's kind of hits a lot of things that I love that I think that I kind of, am good at or have a deep interest in, which would be comedy, horror, psychological thrillers. I do love drama as well. I don't know, you know, people may not know this out here, but my first love is acting. It's just like doing theater and wanting to portray characters. And more than anything, I love when I see a performance that makes me feel something. When I can see another actor performing something and it seems so real and so deep that it stirs an emotion in me and like, not saying I'm that good, but that's like kind of my goal is to get to that point. We're going to put you through the ring with my acting. Hey, I'm here for it. You, you know, like the just every time Justin Long's in a movie, like, you know, something terrible happens. It's yeah. Be, yeah. Let's do Leo and the Revenant. You need yeah, me to man. crawl inside a horse Let's and get it. frostbite. Like I'm willing to do it. Um, who yeah. else is, uh, working on the film? We have, um, Justin, who you've worked with in the past. Yeah, the, Justin Burquist. Yeah, yeah, cinematographer. I know people out there don't know Justin, but he is uh he's really talented filmmaker, cinematographer. Yeah, he's uh he's producing this and uh he's helping out in a bunch of the you know, when you're producing a movie, you do so many things. And uh yeah, he's helped getting a lot of things uh moving on it. Our DP is uh Ray Gallardo and uh he's amazing. He shot Friend of the World, he's okay. an amazing cinematographer. And um yeah, and we're we're gonna have a meeting today about it, and uh, he's uh, he's really great. Like we're talking about ideas for how we're gonna shoot it because a lot of the movies in one location. We got to find a way to make it interesting and make it um, you know keep it dynamic. Yeah, and I think Ray's gonna be really good for that. Friend of the World is also mostly one location, so he has experience making one location chamber piece type movies really interesting visually. So uh, yeah, he's gonna be awesome, and we have a great cast. We have amazing. Uh, pretty much all local actors, and they're all amazing. Like, okay. it's just an amazing cast. And um, yeah, so I think it's going to be a good ensemble piece. Yeah, some good performances. 
Yeah, I know that it's it's still uh, in the early stages of this movie, Corpse in Kensington, so there's not too much we can say, but um, I think pretty much all the information that's available right now is probably up on the Indiegogo, Mm -hmm. right? And your Indiegogo hasn't launched yet, correct? So it's still in the pre-launch phase, which means people can follow it, kind of get on the mailing list for it, um, and then they will get updates on the movie as it progresses. Yeah, it goes live April 9th, and you can sign up early and get a discount you sign up beforehand you'll get a, a discount on the day of so all right so you know what if you're watching this out there go check out the link for this indiegogo uh just follow the page you don't you know it's up to you you decide if you want to contribute to it or not but following the getting the updates will at least keep you informed so you'll know when the movie's out get your email on there and yeah, yeah. and we'll uh, you'll be able to see uh the old d-man uh and mr blonde you know Hashing it out. Toe to toe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm super excited. Um, yeah, I can't even tell you. Uh, I've been preparing for the role heavily, so well, I don't even... Uh, what am I even going to say about Sleeping that? Sleeping on your crush's couch? Yeah, I do, I'm doing some method acting. Uh, <laughs> yeah, my couch, because... Uh, yeah, technically, you're, you're I'm, wife, ma- I'm yeah. married, so yeah, yeah, yeah she yeah, is so my crush, and yeah. I, I, I do sleep on that sleep couch. Sleep on the couch, get into character. <laughs> Yeah, could you oh, could yeah. you uh, treat me like I'm a homeless person today? This is really <laughs> going to help with my performance here. Have a killer walking around outside. So, um, yeah. other than the Corpse in Kensington, what's uh, what do you got planned for the future? Do you have more screenplays you're working on? Or are you just focusing uh, on this 100? percent Do you keep uh, stuff on the back burner? Yeah, I have ideas for other movies and stuff. This yeah. movie goes back like 10 years. I wrote uh, this was a little play I wrote in like 2013, and at right down the street it's uh, San Diego State. We shot a little scene from it, five minute scene. And pretty cringy looking back on it, but a couple of years ago, I kind of gave myself the challenge of what genres do I hate? And I was like, I hate modern slasher movies. They're so boilerplate. I wanna, I wanna give myself this challenge of making that interesting. And I also hate mumblecore. How do I make that interesting? Combining those, make that interesting. So it's this old script that I hate, genres that I hate, combining them together, trying to make them interesting to me somehow. Okay. And um, yeah. Nice. That's where you really you get fueled from from those passions, and that's kind of when yeah. the the best projects come out. And it comes out ten years later. Sometimes you're like that that old thing dusted off. And but yeah, I have a couple others on on the back burner someday. But uh, right now, focusing on one project at a time and cool, yeah, going full force. Awesome. Well, you know what? I think let's wrap it up there and leave people on that note. A Corpse in Kensington is going to be, we're going to be shooting it in the next few months. The Indiegogo is going up April 9th. Mm -hmm. So everybody can go on the pre page and follow it. If you're interested, it's going to be a movie starring me uh, in the main role. Uh, Michael Madsen is going to be featured in the film as well. And uh, hope everybody out there um, enjoyed this podcast, getting to see what I'm up to, getting to meet Brian uh, hope you find the movie interesting. If you if you like what we're talking about, go ahead and check that out. And uh, do you have any parting words before we uh, hit the road here? Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Thank you oh, for your and, time. and uh, Evangelion. Oh, maybe cut that out. Yeah, I don't know if uh, I don't know if this indie go <laughs> is going to go be happening. Lot. Ooh, oh, yeah. indie we'll, indie JoJo. We'll we'll talk about that later. <laughs> Hey, thanks for watching, everybody. And, uh, you know, it's a pleasure to be back on microphone. Don't know when I'll be back again. So until next time, stay strange, everybody.